this time, the children can go. Oh, they already left? <laughs> Both of them already left? Okay. Um, just to clarify some of the announcements, I know there were a lot, so I just want to review some of them with you. Uh, as you heard, there is a barbecue coming up, and that is at one of our members' homes. Uh, he lives in a beautiful place out uh, not too far from there, 15, 20 minutes out from here. We did it last year. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We barbecued outdoors. We had a lot of food. So uh, please uh, come if you can. The sign-up sheets are in the back. Uh, if you can drive and you have space in your car, uh, please indicate that because we're probably going to need to carpool together. So uh, make that mark. And also, uh, we also had time for Min Sok Chung. And if you don't know where that is, that is a traditional folk village uh, that's not too far from here as well. And it's a lot of fun, there's a lot of stuff to do with the family, a lot of activities, a lot of things to see, a lot of crafts you can do, so uh, hopefully you, know, you can come and uh, especially if you would like to invite some people, uh, maybe you know some friends or some co-workers who uh, might be interested in, in seeing the kind of cultural sites. Uh, that is a great time to invite them. Uh, they can get to know us, they can get to see some great cultural sites. So uh, I encourage you to do that if you have anyone on your mind. Okay, uh, why don't we pray now and we'll go into the message. Let's pray together. The Lord, we just invite you right now to speak with your truth to our hearts. Whatever it is, God, that you wish to impart unto us, God, may you have your way. Uh, we pray that you would give your word the authority uh, to speak to us, to change us. We pray that you would soften our hearts so that we can receive your word with gladness and joy. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Without forgiveness, we have no relationship with God. That is one of the basic concepts that we understand as Christians. Uh, without forgiveness, without the forgiveness of God, we have no access with God, uh, we have no hope with God. None of the promises of the Gospel are for us when we don't have forgiveness. We, have, we don't have access to any of those things. There is no Gospel without forgiveness. There is no cross. What Jesus accomplished on the cross was for the forgiveness of sins. Without forgiveness, there is no cross. And Jesus would never have come because His mission was to bring forgiveness of sins. Scripture tells us that if we haven't forgiven others, that we shouldn't even worship. It says that even, even if we're prepared to worship, we brought our sacrifice with us, we brought whatever it is that we want to bring to God. If we haven't forgiven in our hearts, then it says, don't even come to worship. Forgiveness and worship go together. They always go together. We're even told that if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. So, if we, if we refuse to forgive others, if we refuse to give the forgiveness that God desires, then we can't even have a relationship with God. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you here are feeling distant with God. Uh, maybe you feel there's, there's a separation between you and God. Uh, I would say maybe uh, one thing you can look at is maybe there is bitterness in your heart. Maybe there is in your heart unforgiveness for someone. When we look at these concepts of forgiveness in the Bible, when we look at what the Bible has to say about forgiveness, it's very clear, right? Forgiveness is incredibly important. Right? We can't have a relationship with God without forgiveness. God doesn't even want our worship without forgiveness. And when we don't forgive, God won't even forgive us. Right? This is, I mean, you look at forgiveness, this is incredibly important to understand, and yet, 
Isn't it true that so often we have a hard time understanding forgiveness? We have a hard time understanding how to forgive, what it means to forgive, what it means even to be forgiven. Uh, last week, if you were here, uh, we talked about how real gospel change, really being changed by the gospel, it isn't measured by what happens on the outside. You know, what, what I shared with you was, you can have someone who is incredibly spiritually gifted, you know, the best preacher, you know, can do miracles, has, has the ability to understand the mysteries of God, and can do great spiritual acts, sacrificing their body, giving generously to the poor. They can do all these things, and yet, uh, if you remember, I said all those things added up, those spiritual gifts, those spiritual actions, if you put them all together, but you take out godly character, and you have nothing. You have zero. So what I shared was the real power of the gospel, the real sign of a heart that is changed by the gospel, is a heart that is more patient, a heart that is kind, a heart that is generous, a heart that hopes until the end for someone. This is what real gospel change looks like. Now, can spiritual gifts and can uh, the spiritual acts that we do, can they be a sign that God is working in us? Yes. Uh, I want to not make that mistake of, of communicating that to you. That is not my intention. Uh, they can be a sign. Both the spiritual acts, the spiritual gifts, they can be a sign. But the true sign of gospel change, the true sign that we have the gospel working in us, is not changed behavior, it's not changed circumstances, it's a changed heart. A changed heart is a true sign of gospel change. And a heart that is changed by the gospel can forgive. It is one of the key signs of gospel change. If you want to look for someone who has been transformed by the gospel, you want to look at that person and ask, can that person forgive? Does that person have an incredible capacity to forgive? That is a sign of true gospel change. Now, our passage today uh, is one of the classic teachings about forgiveness. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read this before, if this is your first time, but in the beginning of the reading, you see that Peter asks a question. And this is a question that maybe some of you all have asked at some point. And maybe, you know, the situation was maybe there was someone who really upset Peter. Maybe there was someone who was really getting on Peter's nerves and he was really, or he didn't really like this guy. Uh, and the way that Peter asked this question shows that Peter was actually feeling pretty good about how he was forgiving this person. So we don't know if this is true, but my guess is that the reason he asked this question the way he did uh, is because there was someone in his life that he was trying to forgive. And so Jesus asked, uh, and then Peter asked, how many times should I forgive uh, someone? And he said, seven times. Now, seven times. Seven times is no small thing. I don't know about you, but most of the time, I'm more like a two or three person time. A three, two or three person of forgiveness, right? I, if you hurt me once, okay, I can maybe let that go. If you hurt me again, I don't know. If you hurt me a third time, the same way, you know, I, I might be ready to like cancel this relationship, right? Two or three times, that's a lot. Seven times to forgive someone, maybe the same way, over and over again, I mean, that is incredibly difficult. But Jesus takes it to an impossible level. Now, one thing you should know about the number seven is that it is a symbolic number in the Bible. In the Bible, seven indicates perfection, it indicates completion, which is probably why, you know, one of the reasons why Peter used this number, it was probably part of the teaching of the Old Testament, uh, something that he learned from uh, his time in uh, the church and the temple. 
And so he uses this number seven. He says, you know, if I, if I forgive someone seven times, then surely that is the perfect number to forgive someone. Right? That, that is an incredible amount of forgiveness. And Jesus takes that concept of perfection, of seven times of forgiveness, and he says, multiply that by 77 times. Take that level of human perfection of forgiving someone seven times. And he says, I want you to multiply that 77 times more. He's not giving us a number. Uh, he's not saying, once you reach 77 times seven, that you have reached the goal. He's saying there is no limit. Uh, what you think is perfection in terms of your forgiving capacity, He's saying there is no limit. You have to go far beyond that. There is, there is nothing that you can compare it to. And then Jesus tells a story. And some of you know this story. He tells a story about a servant who owes a king 10,000 talents. Now, when Jesus uses a very specific number or very specific detail uh, in his parables, we need to pay attention. There's something very important about this number. Uh, you see, in that culture, the average worker made about one talent a year. So after working one whole year, hard work, uh, they would make maybe one talent, maybe a little more than a talent. So, you know, you compare to Today's culture, maybe it's like $30,000, $40,000 in terms of U.S. dollars. I mean, it's not a small amount. So how much would 10,000 talents be? Well, I calculated this. Uh, with the average worker salary, in dollars, that would be $300 billion. $10,000, $300 billion. In one, I calculated this too, in one, in case it's a $300 billion, I don't know if that feels like a lot, but in Korean money, in one, uh, I think they call it UK, right? $100,000 is UK. So this would actually be 300000 UK. I don't know if that, if that makes it feel bigger for you. Um, that doesn't do anything for me, but $300 billion is a lot of money. Now, is that a debt that you can manage? Not, not even the richest people in the world can manage this kind of debt. This is impossible. Clearly impossible. It's a ridiculous number. It's a number that we can't even imagine. I mean, I've, never, I've never had a billion of anything. A billion, 300 billion. This is the kind of debt that can sink an entire country. I mean, this is not just something that will hurt a corporation or a family. This can sink an entire nation. $300 billion debt. And there's a question here that we might ask. Well, first of all, what could this person have possibly done to build such a debt? How do we even spend that much money? There's something there about his life story. I'm sure most of us here have had debt. Uh, I'm sure some of you here probably have some debt. Maybe you don't. Uh, but how would you feel if you had debt like this? How would you feel if you had $300 billion of debt? No. No. You would think, my life is over. Right? Uh, you might, I mean, you might want to no longer live. I mean, someone who is desperate enough, they might want to end their life. What can you do? When you have a $300 billion debt, there's nothing you can do. It's completely hopeless. I mean, it's a place of despair. No matter how much you earn, even if you make $30,000, $40,000 a year, and you put all of that money into paying off the debt, it would still take thousands of years to pay off. That is not a debt that you can touch. And that is a debt that defines your life. It, it controls your life. What about for that king? What about for that king? Well, for the king, that is an incredible debt to have to deal with. 
Like I said, this is the kind of debt that can sink a small nation. A small country, $300 billion debt, that is significant. And for a king, that is a big problem. And what does the servant say? The servant says to the king, have patience with me. Have patience with me, and I will pay everything. Now, first of all, there's no way he can pay that back. So he's just saying that. Uh, but that first line, have patience with me, he's asking for mercy. Now I want to break down this word, patience. We look at that word, patience, and we may have a very simple understanding of what that means. But if you remember, the first word in the whole passage in Corinthians about love, remember, love is patient, love is kind, that whole, whole passage about love, that first word is patient. Right? Love is patient. And if you break down that word, patient, there's actually two parts to that word, if you look at the original language. And it actually has a time element, long time, the second part is an action element, suffering. So this word, patient, actually means suffering for a long time. And this is what the meaning is behind this. But an ability to suffer for a long time, to endure suffering. This is one of the marks of gospel change. If you want to look for someone who has been transformed by the gospel, you look for someone who experiences insults, who can experience pain and suffering and hurt over a long period of time, and they are not broken by it. That is a sign of true gospel change. When you see that in someone, it's a sign that God is working in their hearts. You see, we all know that suffering will happen. Right? You cannot, can any of you choose not to suffer? Can you say, this year, I am not going to suffer? You can't do that. None of us has control over suffering. No matter how much you try, no matter how wealthy you are, how powerful you are, none of you have a choice when it comes to suffering. We will all suffer. It is not our choice. We all will receive suffering as we live. But there is one thing that we do have control over. And that is, we can control how we receive the suffering. Suffering is guaranteed. But if you have godly patience, then no matter what happens to you, you won't be destroyed by it. No matter what kind of pain, no matter what kind of insult, no matter what kind of offense, it won't destroy the core of who you are. You could say it's a difference between water and clay. You take a lump of clay, and if you hit that lump of clay, what happens? It leaves a mark, right? The clay changes shape. But I would say a gospel transformed person, someone who has this godly patience, they can get hit by things, and like water, they come right back. It gets hit, and it comes back. It gets hit, and it never loses its shape. It never loses its true identity. It keeps its core identity no matter what happens. That is the mark of someone who has been transformed by the gospel. Suffering and pain, insult, offense, doesn't shape who that person is. Doesn't transform that person. Now, there are three things that I want to show you. Three things that the king did to show uh, his patience, to show this capacity for long suffering. And I, I want to show you what he did. It's very important to see. It's very practical. Uh, as I explain this, I want you to think about how you can immediately begin to apply these concepts. The first thing is, the king looked at the servant, and the king pitied him. The second thing, the king forgave his debts. And the third thing, the king said, let him go. Okay, so three things. The king looked at the servant, pitied him, had compassion on him. Second thing is, the king 
forgave his debts, canceled his debts, and third, the king said, you can let him go. Now let's start with the first. The king pitied and had compassion on this servant. Now, what's the first thing you do when someone hurts you? Maybe you don't realize it, but the first thing that we all do when someone hurts us is we compare. We say, how could that person do that? Right? How could that person hurt me like that? How could that person do something like that? Right? It's, it's, that person did something so unbelievable. What, what are we doing here? We are emphasizing how different that person is from us. Right? We're saying, that person is someone I cannot understand. They are like an alien to me. I would never do that. Right? That's not something I would do. I'm so different. They are just completely unreasonable. Right? What, what are we doing? We're, we're creating an exaggerated picture of someone. So what happens is we begin to see that person only through what they did to us. So let's say you're driving on the road and someone cuts in front of you. Who is that person to you? That person is just someone who cut in front of you. Right? There, is, there is nothing more to that person's identity. You're not, you're not thinking about, oh, what kind of family does he have? Or and I wonder if, if he's late for work. Or I wonder, I hope he gets to where he's going. You're not, you're not thinking about anything else about who he is. The only thing that matters to you, the only thing that you see that person as is, that person cut me off. That is who that person is. This is a person who cuts me off. Isn't that true? We create the simplest version that we can of that person and we exaggerate that person based on what they did to us. If someone lies to you what is, and, and it upsets you deeply, what do we say? You're a liar, right? What is that? You're saying your identity is a liar. They lie to you. Does that mean that their identity is a liar? Probably not. But you're saying who you are is you are a liar. What is, what is it that we're doing here? We're making a very simple picture of something. But what do you do when you lie? What do you do when you cut someone off? You say, oh, but you know what? I'm so late for work and I hope they understand. Or, you know what? Oh, I didn't need to do that. Or, you know, uh, you know I, I took a little more time to get ready this morning. But when you lie, you, you know, I know I know I lied, but I have very good reason to lie. And I was really scared that you might yell at me. Or, you know what? I need to protect this certain situation. Right? What is it that we're doing? We, we, we have very complex ideas about ourselves. Right? When we look at ourselves, we, we, we see all the story, all the layers, all the complications, all the, the good reasons why we did it. But when we get hurt, when we get hurt, uh, we tend to see others very simply. And we create this picture of them. So, how do we do what the king did? How do we pity? How do we have compassion on someone? We have to choose to see the things that we have in common. We have to look at that person and say, what is it that is similar between us? What is it that makes us both human? We're both sinners. We both have family. I don't know. Whatever it is, you look for ways to find common ground. See them as complicated. See the person that you're upset with as a very complex person with their own reasons and ideas for doing what they did. Because they do. They are complicated people. When we get angry, we want to make them very simple so that we can be angry as much as we want. But once we make them complicated, then we say, oh, but you know what? Actually, maybe it's because they had a really hard day. And it begins to empathize. And it begins to reduce your anger. And it helps you to forgive and to, to reconcile. Secondly, uh, the king forgave his debts. When you get hurt, 
Don't you feel like you're owed something? Don't you feel like you need to pay them back? And they, there's a debt that needs to be paid. When I get cut off on the road, when, when I'm driving and someone cuts me off, what is it that I want to do? What is it that, that you want to do? If you were driving and you were caught off on the road, what is it that you want to do? You want to cut them off, right? You want to pay them back in the very same way that you were paid, right? It is a debt. You feel that they owe you something, right? You feel that you need to somehow compensate this cost. What this is, it's, it's a justice debt. Justice needs to be paid. And you're feeling that debt. And until you get that debt paid, it's heavy, it hurts, right? it's upsetting, it's, it, it bothers you. So how do we forgive the debt that's in our hearts when we get hurt? Well, the debt doesn't just disappear. When the king forgave 10,000 talents of debt, it still had to be paid. It's not like that $10,000 of debt just disappeared. The king had to take on that debt and pay for it himself somehow. So the king paid that debt. And that is what it means to forgive a debt. That is a process that needs to happen, is you pay for it instead. How hard is it not to force someone to pay the justice debt when you get hurt or offended. How hard is it? Especially if it's very hurtful. If someone said something very hurtful to you or did something very hurtful to you, how easy is it to let go of that justice debt? It's very hard. How easy is it to just hold it in and not force that person to pay for it? It's very difficult. It's costly. It hurts. That's what it means to pay the debt. Now, let me be clear. What I'm talking about here is revenge. Uh, so I'm not saying that when injustice happens that you should just let it go. I'm not saying uh, that justice is not important, that you, you shouldn't seek justice, you shouldn't seek legal compensation when it is correct. Now, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm talking about is revenge. And when we refuse to take revenge on someone. When someone hurts us and we refuse to enact our revenge, oh, it's, it's hurt, it's hurtful, right? It's painful. It's really hard. But let me say this. When you do take revenge, let's say you decide, I am going to have my revenge. I am going to cut that person off. You know what? That person lied to me. You know what? I'm going to spread some kind of gospel about that person, right? That person said this hurtful word about me, I'm going to come right back and say another hurtful word at that person. When you take revenge, there is also a cost. And it's tricky because it doesn't hurt in the moment, right? It feels good. When you take revenge, it feels good. But there is a cost. And it is a great cost. The cost is you will be shaped and changed by that man. You will be changed. It is impossible to act on your vengeance and not be changed by that act. You will be changed by that evil, by that sinful act of revenge that will change your heart. So you will always be changed by revenge, no matter how small it is. You know, well, you know, I just cut that person off. He deserved it. You may not think that was a large cost to pay, but it was. It changed you in a very significant way. When we enact our revenge, it hardens our hearts, it makes us cynical, it makes us angry, it makes us more liable to sin in this way, to seek revenge in this way. That is a very big cost, but we don't always sense it. We don't always sense that it's happening. Third, the king looked at the servant and he said, let go. Now, this is where I want you all to be clear. We shouldn't confuse 
forgiveness with justice. <coughs> Notice that the king let him go, but he punished him later when he found out that the servant was a wicked person. When he found out that the servant was not innocent, that it wasn't a mistake, he punished him for that wicked heart. So we can let the person go, but not let the injustice go. So this is why I'm trying to make this very clear. To forgive someone does not mean you ignore justice. Forgiveness and justice must go together. But let me put it this way, and I think this will make it a little bit clear, because I know this might be a little confusing. Let me put it this way. Uh, if you don't forgive someone, but you look for justice without forgiving that person. Let's say you still have that bitter heart. You still want to hurt that person, right? You want to enact vengeance. And you have that, that bitter heart. And you say, I'm going to go for justice. It will be impossible. You cannot seek justice while not having forgiven. Because your justice will just be revenge. You will not be able to seek pure justice if you're not forgiven. <coughs> because all you're going to want to do is to see that person suffer. All you're going to want to do is to see that person hurt. But that's not justice. That's the confusion that we have. Confusion, I'm mean, sorry, justice is not just about punishment. Justice is about restoration. Justice is about healing. Justice is about making something whole. So without forgiveness, if you, if you try to seek justice between you and another person, and you have not forgiven that person, you will always seek to hurt that person more than they deserve. You will always seek, more than anything else, just revenge. Because there's a bitterness in your heart. But with forgiveness, if you have forgiven the person, if you say, I let that person go, I cancel their debt, then you can go in and you can seek justice. You can seek righteous justice. You can seek for things to be made right. Not just punished, not just someone hurt, but to, for, for everything to be made whole and restored according to the will of God. Do you see the difference there? It's a very big difference. But so often, we confuse vengeance and justice. They are not the same. And forgiveness and justice, we sometimes separate those two, but they go together. Now, how do we do all this? And this, is, this sounds very, very hard. Uh, you know, we're, we're all bad at this. We're all bad at forgiving. We've all been in that place where someone's hurt us, and we had a really hard time forgiving the person. Or, you know, you think you've forgiven the person and uh, it comes back again and again. So, you know, forgiveness is one of those things where we struggle with it. So how, how do we forgive? Like, the Bible is calling us to forgive. Well, we have to look to our King. We have to look to Jesus. Jesus was a King who became a servant. He is the king who took on our debt. And he knew that if he took on the debt that we have, uh, he knew that it wasn't just uncomfortable. He knew that it wouldn't just be a burden. He knew that he would kill it. Uh, he knew that taking on our debt would mean that he would have to give up his life. And he took on the debt because he knew very clearly that we had no ability to pay him back. He knew that even if it took thousands of years, millions of years of perfect behavior, perfect holiness, that we would never get there. Right? Even with all the advancements of human technology and philosophy and everything that we can achieve as a human race, God knew that we would never get to a place where we can pay off the full debt. We'll never get there. We're hopeless. We're stuck. We're lost. And so he came and he paid the debt. He took it on himself. He took on the debt 
and so we will be free. And the gospel really comes alive for us when we place what Jesus did for us and we place it alongside the debts that we receive from other people. When we see that contrast, that is when we can really live according to the gospel. When we're willing to see the debt that Jesus paid for us alongside, contrasting with the debts that we receive from other people. And this is why the story has two parts. You have two scenes here, right? In the first scene, you have the king and the servant. And what is the debt? It is 10,000 talents, which I said to you is probably going to be about $300 billion. So there's this huge amount. And the first scene, we see the king say, you're forgiven, I take on your debt, it's canceled. In the second scene, what do we see? That same servant who's forgiven, goes to another servant, and it says the amount was 100 denarii. And just so you know, 100 denarii is a few dollars. Maybe, so, a few thousand won. It's very little money. Do you see the contrast that Jesus made here? You need to see that this is not, these are not random numbers. This is very, very purposeful. We need to see the forgiveness of God for our debts placed next to the debts that we receive from others in that extreme, in that kind of impossible extreme. And really, the patience and the forgiveness that God calls us to do for one another is only possible when we allow the gospel to work in our hearts. You see, you will never forgive like Jesus forgives until you receive fully the forgiveness of God. So I would say this, if you struggle, let's say you're saying to me, a oh, pastor, you know, I really struggle with forgiveness. Maybe I just need to work harder. Pastor, you know, I, there's this person in my life, I have such a hard time forgiving this person, and you're really struggling with that. And maybe you're saying, I just need to read the Bible more, or I need to you know, do this, I need to do that. And maybe you're looking for different ways to, to, to figure out how to grow in forgiveness. And I would say, the only thing you need to learn, you need to learn the extent to which you've been forgiven. That is what you need. It is not any kind of discipline in you. It is not kind of any power that you create on your own. When you fully receive the forgiveness of God for your sin, when you understand how much He forgave, to what extent He forgave, the cost that He paid to forgive, when you fully grasp that, that is what allows you to forgive like He did. I want you to really understand that everything I shared with you in the beginning of the sermon, right, all the, the 90% in the beginning of the sermon, this is not behavioral modification. This is not some kind of self-help technique. All of that I just shared with you, all of that is possible only when you receive the full forgiveness of Jesus for your sins. When you understand that, you have the power to do everything else I just told you that the Bible asks you to do. So when we are struggling to forgive, when you wonder, how can I forgive this person? Right? This is the key. The backdrop to every moment of forgiveness in your life has to be this. This has to be uh, the context for every time you forgive. You need to see the debt that he paid for you. Right? You need to see that 10,000 talents. You need that to be the context through which you begin to look at what someone else did to you. And you begin to then see the contrast. And through that, as that reality transforms you, you can have that godly patience, that long suffering, where suffering and pain and injury and offense doesn't shape who you are. Why? Because this is what shapes you, nothing else. This shapes you, 
not what someone says about you, not the offenses you receive, the pain you receive. This is the only thing that determines your identity. And when that is true, that is when you can forgive. And I pray that God would more and more, uh, more than, I want to make this very clear, more than I would pray that you get more discipline or that you get more willpower, that's not what I'm going to pray for you. My prayer for you is that you understand how much you've been forgiven. Because that is the key. And I pray that today you would leave having understood that a little more. Having understood what you've been forgiven a little more. Let's pray together.